Hello everyone, and welcome back. Okay, let's get right into this example. So this time we're dealing with an air standard cycle. It's executed within a closed piston cylinder system. Magic, you know, the air doesn't leave, it doesn't go anywhere. And it consists of the following three processes. Okay, from one to two, volume is constant. From two to three, we have isothermal expansion. And from three to one, pressure is constant. One to two is where we have our heat addition. Three to one is where we have our heat rejection. And some key details here that when it expands, it's now eight and a half times what it was originally. Another little helpful thing for us here is that this has constant properties. This means I have constant specific heats, which will help me because I don't have to go to the tables. I can just use these values. That comes in handy because for most problems like this, we're trying to figure out differences in enthalpy and internal energy. That's how we're going to figure out how much power is being produced. And that comes from, I kind of mix this up there, that guy there, and that guy there. Now, what are we actually trying to find? We're trying to find thermal efficiency and the ratio of back work. What is this guy? We'll get to it very, very soon. So let's try it out. Okay, so the first step in almost any of these problems is draw your PV and TS diagram. Now, as a note, it does not have to be perfectly to scale. These guys are not to scale, okay? That's not to scale, that's not to scale. If they were, they would look slightly different. And also, you don't have to have your shapes perfectly correct. Things you should try to do your best to match up are, one, if it says constant volume, make sure it's a straight line in a PV diagram. And if it's constant pressure, do the same. If it's an isothermal, make sure it's a straight line. Everything else, just make it curvy lines that connect everything. And since you're not doing any like, you know, math with those lines, you'll be okay. Okay. Second thing is, let's start walking through here and finding our temperatures. Why temperatures? Because we have constant specific heats, and that means that H is not going to go to the tables. Nope, we don't have to do that. Instead, all we need to find H or U is to look at the temperatures. So we got to find the temperatures at each of our points. That's what we're doing here. Now, T2 isn't too hard, and the reason for it is because it's an ideal gas. Now, why is it an ideal gas? Because it said so. That's part of the air standard assumptions is that's an ideal gas, is we can use our ideal gas relations to get this. Where does it come from? Well, PV equals RT. We're assuming here specific volume because I wasn't given a mass. And so as far as we know, this could be for a billion kilograms. It could be for one kilogram. Let's just go ahead and divide by some sort of standard unit and get specific volume. Okay, PV equals RT. Now, since I know for that first process from one to two, it's constant volume. That means that my volume doesn't change. So if I wanted to rewrite that, I could say V is equal to P, oh, that's okay, that gets to be R, RT over P. And that could be the same for one and for two, because volume doesn't change. If I rearrange things a little bit, I get this equation over here. So that's where it comes from. It's just your ideal gas law. And as a note, if you have constant specific heats, ideal gas law is going to be coming up a whole lot. Okay, next thing we realize is that temperature 3 and temperature 2, they're the same because it's isothermal. We see that on our TS diagram. We also see it in our basic description. So make sure you're paying attention to what it says the cycle does. So since I know my temperature at 2, I know my temperature at 3, which gives me 1, 2, 3, all the temperatures, which means I should now be able to calculate everything I need using my constant specific heats. Okay, so we're going to aim on first. Well, we're going to be working on the ratio back work. To do that, I need to find the work in. Now, I want to go ahead and mention something to you because I kind of lied to you a little bit earlier just because I was trying to simplify things when I was introducing a concept. Um, and I mentioned this. First off, this area right here and this area right here. Both of those are equal to the network. Okay, that is completely true. And if this was perfectly scaled and I was actually to add up the area, I would actually see that it's the same area. Amazingly enough, Provided I have my units in the right units. Okay. Now, one thing I mentioned was, well, the TS diagram, you know, it's the area under this line, right? That's not 100% true. It's true when I have a Carnot cycle, but for a TS diagram, um, when I'm talking about the thermal efficiency, it's only the area under the heat addition that gives me my QN. Like, that's the QN right there. And so I'm trying to find my actual thermal efficiency. It's that area 
divided by my net worth. Sorry, reverse that. My thermal efficiency is equal to, I cannot write today, my network over QN. Now, if you're looking here, that doesn't seem to make much sense because it looks like this guy right here is much, much larger, but this is not to scale. That's one thing you have to be careful for when you're seeing these little diagrams I'm drawing. I'm not drawing it to scale. If I was, they would be very, very different. You would notice that this area would be much, much larger. Okay. Now, what you might notice here is that this is a straight line where I add the heat. There is no area right here. So I can't actually get my thermal efficiency from a PV diagram. And even in a TS diagram, I have to know something about my cycle to know where the heat's being inputted. Is the heat being input from two to three? Well, that would be the area I care about. Is it from one to two? Is it from one to three? I have to know that. So just having a picture isn't always enough unless you know how the cycle's running. Okay, so my PV diagram, what does it tell me? Well, this area, just like I said before, that is the area of the work of the compressor. Okay, and just like I said before, this area is how much power the turbine gets out. So far, so good, right? And so that gets network. It makes sense. Now, with that, what you might notice is that from this diagram, we never saw QN. Like, there was no QN here. I can only get that from this diagram down here. So if I were to take the ratio of my turbine work and my compressor work, I don't actually get thermal efficiency because neither of those is equal to my heat in. What I get is actually the ratio of back work as we're gonna see later. So just know that one of these can get me my ratio of back work and the other one can technically give me my thermal efficiency. But in the end, if you're not doing a Carnot cycle, you need to calculate Q in and calculate your network by hand rather than just looking at a picture. Okay, with that being said, let's calculate the work input. How do we do that? Not too terribly bad. That's gonna be how much energy the compressor is doing, which is this area right here. Now, luckily for us, my pressure is constant. So that's just PDV. Like I can even look at this and know. So volume one, volume three, do I know those though? The answer is no, I don't. However, ideal gas law. And so if I have ideal gas law, I know that PV equals RT. And so I can just plug that in here, which is what I do. So I have it plugged in now. I have my temperature. The first one was given me, to me. The second one we calculated. And I calculated that 639.3 kilojoules per kilogram. That's how many, much energy it takes to run the compressor. Well, in this case, I don't have a compressor, but it's how much energy it takes to compress the gas. And later on to run a compressor. But for now, to compress the gas. As a note, I am an aerospace engineer. I often talk about things in terms of turbines and compressors because that's how jet engines work. Um, so forgive me if I always say compressor. Okay, now the work output. That's how much energy is escaping. This is a piston, so it's turning something, but it's providing power when it does that. If it had been a jet engine, it would have been a turbine. So that's gonna be the difference between here and here. And so I gotta figure out the work from th between these two states, which is just the area under this line, which is why we're doing an integral of PDV. However, in this case, you can see that my pressure changes. My pressure is not constant. Since it is not constant, that means that I'm going to have to integrate it, which means I need to get a, in a form for my um, specific volume because I'm integrating with respect to volume here. How do I do that? I'm lost. No, I'm not. It's okay. Once again, ideal gas law. Like I said, it comes up a billion times. If you're wondering why I have bounds of two and three here, note that's not actual numbers. I'm not integrating. We're not going to plug in two and three. That's just saying from state two to state three. So be very careful about that. If you don't know what the integral from of R2 over V is, brush up on your calculus. But here it is. It's natural log of the ratio of V3 over V2. I don't know what my specific volume at three is, but I know that it's eight and a half times specific volume at two. Specific volume at two cancels. So I'm left with this guy right here, which I can plug in happily. And I get my answer, which is 1,550 kilojoules per kilogram. So with that, I now have both my work in and work out. And my ratio back work is just simply the ratio of those two. 
So what this tells me right here is that I am using 41% of my energy just to run my cycle. That's just to keep it going. So we want this guy to go down. 0% would be amazing. It's not possible, but we want it to be as low as possible. The lower it is, the better my cycle is. So we want ratio back work to go low because that is good. Because we're wasting less energy running the cycle. The closer it approaches 100 or 1, it's wasting all the energy just running the cycle. And if it was somehow greater than 1, well, that means that you're actually having to put energy into the cycle to keep it running, which doesn't make any sense for us. Okay, now we're trying to get our thermal efficiency, which means I need to find my heat input. That's what this is talking about here. Why is it from 1 to 2? Because that's the only time where I'm actually inputting heat. Any changes in temperature after that are just simply doing to the, due to the compression of the gas. So, now, I don't have everything I need there from just looking at it from the side, but what I can do is I realize that I can use conservation of energy here. What's conservation of energy? Come on, you remember that. You remember that. E in minus E out equals change in E of the system. I know it's been a while since we've gone through, I think, chapter, oh goodness, chapter two in your textbook. It's been a while. But conservation of energy is where we're going here. So first off, what's energy in? Well, that's Q in. What's energy out? That's the work out. And then finally, it's going to be equal to the change in energy of the system, delta E of the system, which is just simply the change in internal energy. Why internal energy? Because this is a constant vo or a closed volume. That's why we have in um, internal energy. Okay, so with that in mind, let's calculate. We're trying to solve for the heat input. So if I can figure out the change in my internal energy from state one to state three, as well as the work input, which I already have, um, or sorry, work output, which I already have, I can solve this problem. So I have that. Here's the work output. Here's my change in internal energy. And that gives me 3,181.7 kilojoules per kilogram. Now I have my heat input. I have my net work because I have both the work out and work in. I can now solve for my thermal efficiency. So I figure out what my work out minus my work in is, which is the net work, divided by my heat input. And I get that I have a thermal efficiency of 28.93%. So I'm using 30%, roughly, of the thermal energy that's there, impossible to use. So this is 100. If I were to divide this in 10, I'm not going to do a good job of it. I am using, eh, let's do it about there. Okay, so that's the energy that's actually used. And this is the energy that's wasted. Or expelled, or whatever you want to call it. So I'm not using all of it. How can I improve this? Well, I can make this temperature lower. I can make this temperature higher. Whatever I can do to input energy at higher temperatures and reject it at lower temperatures will help me to have a more efficient cycle. Um, and we have no you know, view into this cycle here, but we have a whole bunch of cycles we're going to learn about that are going to help us to maximize those efficiencies as best as possible. Okay, that's it for this time, everybody. Thank you so much, and I'll see you all later. Bye-bye.